Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, thank you all for coming. Very nice to see you. And uh, welcome to another evening here with uh, a returning speaker for us, Professor Neil Barr, who I think some of you may remember spoke to us uh, last, no, not last year before, wasn't it? Oh gosh, wasn't yes, it? it was about 18 months before. Time flies. Well Time flies. <laughs> uh, who spoke to us before uh, about the. Uh, the war in, in the desert. And uh, this evening, you know the title, Yanks and Limeys. And we have, um, we have with us Vic, Vic Greg, who I hope most of you know, who actually will be able, if necessary, to say, I don't think that's quite right. But, uh, <laughs> keep, it to, keep it to the end. But Vic fought all the way through the desert uh, and, and up into to Italy. So um, we have an expert in an expert witness, should we say, in the audience. Thanks very much for coming, Vic. Yeah, it'd be great. Um, on your... You all right? Bless you. Thank you. Okay? It's a bit cold. I think. Do you want to move? No, no, no. No? Sure? Okay. You've got a flyer on your seats just before we, uh, we start. Uh, and it, the next talk, quite a way off yet, but it's the talk by David Erskine Hill, one of our trustees, who is uh, a, he's now the curator of the Ashcroft collection of VCs, and uh, I think it should be absolutely fascinating, uh, and a, a very good evening, one not to miss, exactly as this evening is one not to miss, as your presence here indicates. Uh, but thank you very much indeed for coming along here, and we very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. No, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, so this is very much a, a general talk uh, about the relationship between the British and American armies in the Second World War, and it ranges across a whole range uh, of different subjects, so I hope I won't uh, bamboozle you or confuse you, and I hope uh, I will keep you uh, at least moderately interested and entertained. Um, this came very much from... Uh, or, or this talk very much comes from my book entitled Yanks and Limeys, uh, which was really an attempt to uh, assess this relationship between the British and American armies in the European theatre uh, and to put it in a single volume, because the Anglo-American relationship is, of course, uh, vast and very well known, particularly the relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill. But I wanted to look at this military relationship uh, and uh, see whether, ultimately, see whether General George Marshall was correct. Was this the most complete unification of military effort ever achieved by two allied nations? Uh, and there we have the meeting of minds uh, between Generals Marshall and Dill at the Atlantic Conference uh, on uh, the, the, the deck uh, of the Prince of Wales, and Sergeants Brown and Randall during the link-up in Tunisia in 1943. So it was really uh, an attempt to find out what, whether this really was uh, the case. Um, and right from the start, uh, I learned that there were a number of individuals, I'm afraid I, I don't really have time tonight to go into all of them, maybe we'll explore some of the other ones uh, in questions, but there were people involved in this relationship which uh, are today really very much unknown. Uh, and Field Marshal Dill uh, is one of them. I, I walk past that uh, model uh, on an almost daily basis, and it kind of reminded me and encouraged me as I uh, uh, researched and wrote the book that there was a story here to tell uh, that I think people aren't terribly familiar with. This fine equestrian statue is in the Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, a signal, offer, uh, a signal honour for a British military officer to be bur buried in the American National Cemetery. Uh, Dill has no memorial uh, in the UK. Um, he's almost completely forgotten in the UK. And again, that uh, uh, prompted a, a whole range of questions. Um, and I could have started the book... Uh, as most people, when they look at uh, the Second World War, I could have started in, say, 1939, or maybe if I was bold, uh, 1932. Uh, but I actually decided to go right back to the start. And, uh, of course, I'm very much preaching uh, to the converted here, uh, 
uh, when I mentioned General Braddock uh, and the Battle of the Monongahela in 1755. These were the first British regular troops uh, in America for over 100 years. And I'm afraid the poor General uh, Braddock, when he's ambushed by French and Indian forces, uh, is mortally wounded. Uh, and the British troops, which attempted to form line and fight as if this was Europe, uh, were uh, soundly uh, defeated. Uh, his last words were, "We shall learn how to do. Uh, how, we shall learn better how to do it next time." Uh, but of course, he died uh, before he was able to. And his, at that point, supernumerary aide was a, a certain colonial uh, by the name of George Washington, mm -hmm. and he was very, very disappointed when Braddock died, because Braddock had promised that on the successful completion of uh, the expedition to Fort Duquesne. Uh, Washington would get a regular uh, commission in the British Army. Uh, so uh, the whole history of the world might have turned slightly differently had Washington been given uh, that commission. And it's this very defeat which prompts Cumberland and then uh, officers uh, stationed in America to uh, develop a new regiment, the 60th Royal Amer American Regiment, to fight uh, in the woods of America using Indian and backwoods tactics, which is the very start uh, of British Light in Infantry uh, and the King's Royal Rifle Corps. So uh, actually there is a relationship between the British and American armies which goes back beyond the American War uh, of Independence. Um, and uh, I, I loved when this tweet came out. I'm, I'm not, I, I, I can't keep up with Twitter, but uh, uh, I loved when this uh, particular tweet came out. It went down like a lead balloon in America, uh, and it proves that some things are perhaps best not commemorated, uh, or maybe, maybe they should. Commemorating the 200th anniversary of burning the White House, only sparklers this time. Um, <laughs> Because, of course, the British and American armies have uh, fought. Uh, they've been rivals and enemies uh, as well as friends, uh, both in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, in particular. Of course, 1814 marks the last time that Britain and America actually went to war, although there were a number of occasions in the 19th century uh, when that may have been the case. And the American army itself... Uh, was born in battle fighting against uh, the hated uh, Redcoats in the American War uh, of Independence. So, uh, in fact, the, the cultural memories that these two forces brought to one another, both in the First and Second World Wars, were really quite different. Um, and I think one way of bringing that out is the contrast between these two photographs. Because for any... Uh, any soldier and certainly senior officer of the British Armed Forces uh, and British Army uh, who served in the Second World War if you had asked them what they were doing on the 1st of July 1916 they would probably have been able to tell you whether they served on the Somme or not um, that cultural memory of the Battle of the Somme uh, is burnt deep into the British psyche uh, even today Whereas for Dwight uh, and Mamie Eisenhower, uh, that was their wedding day. America was at peace. So you have a fracture of experience uh, between these two countries uh, in the first part of uh, the 20th century. And that means they bring very different understandings uh, about conflict and war uh, when uh, they become allies uh, in uh, 1941. Um, I have seen Mamie Eisenhower's dress, and I have to say the photograph does not do it justice. It really was very beautiful indeed. Now, having been allies, however briefly, in 1917-1918, uh, in fact there is an interregnum of almost no contact whatsoever during the 20s uh, and 30s. Quite amusingly pointed out by Frederick Morgan, uh, in his book Overture uh, to Overlord, 
a certain amount of polo was played, but that seems to be the, the extent of the liaison that existed between the two forces. And I think what that points out is that Britain and America uh, were not necessarily natural allies before the Second World War. And in this context of you know, the, the post-45 post world, uh, where we see an Anglo-American uh, American alliance as being a natural order of things, it takes an effort to remember that that was not the case before the Second World War. Uh, Britain and America were moving towards cooperation, uh, particularly in the Far East, uh, over Singapore and Pearl Harbor, uh, but their interests actually in, in other parts of the world were often very different. Um, and it's why uh, this special relationship, as we call it, uh, was actually unprecedented at the time. Uh, when the war breaks out, Franklin Roosevelt writes to Churchill as First Lord of the Admiralty, and he makes the excuse that it's the fact that they had both occupied similar positions in the First World War. Now, just imagine uh, a president writing to directly to a cabinet minister today and not going through the prime minister. <clears throat> this is actually very, very strange. And of course, it's because Roosevelt and Chamberlain really did not get on. They did not see eye to eye. Roosevelt is trying to find a way into British councils uh, and British government thinking by bypassing Chamberlain. But when we see this as a special relationship, it's really quite unique because it's, it, it certainly goes against most of the diplomatic niceties of the time or even, uh, even today. No, the real relationship that Britain relied on at the beginning of the Second World War wasn't the Americans. It was the French. It's the Anglo-French alliance that was meant to win the war against Germany when Britain and France declare war uh, uh, against Germany on the 3rd of September 1939. And what is truly shocking is the fact that France is defeated uh, in six weeks and that the British forces in France uh, have to be evacuated, not just from Dunkirk, but from the second Dunkirk uh, at Cherbourg uh, and Brest. And I think that famous photograph of a Par Parisian's reaction to the news of the armistice, in a sense, sums up uh, the huge shock and trauma of 1940. Um, but even in 1940, and I think this is a really critical point, Britain was never alone. Britain never fought alone in the Second World War. David Lowe's cartoon of the time summed up the spirit. Uh, it's wonderful propaganda, but it is just that. Britain was always sustained by its relationships uh, with uh, the dominions and colonies, uh, by Australian, Canadian, New Zealand, Indian, and the like. So Britain never fought the Second World War alone, even once France fell. And really from the minute that France fell, uh, Churchill, now Prime Minister, was working very hard to build a relationship with the United States. Because he knew that without American support, Britain might survive on its island, but it could never prevail. Uh, so in terms of the army relationship, which of course is many stages down from the uh, t top of government, uh, one of the things that Britain needed desperately uh, from the summer of 1940 onwards was more military equipment. Uh, and this was something which uh, the British believed that the Americans could supply. Uh, and in fact, much to British chagrin, the French had got in on that act first. Uh, they had realised their deficiencies and had ordered all of this equipment from the Americans before France fell. So uh, had the war continued, you would have seen uh, American factories churning out French tanks. That had been the deal. 
So in the crisis of 1940, the British send a tank mission to Washington to try and get the Americans to build British tanks. And this is actually the first link between the two armies during the war. Um, but you'll note from this, with France's collapse, the Americans are actually thinking, Britain's not going to last very much longer. Uh, William Knudsen puts it in very bold terms. Britain has only one chance in three of survival against Germany. And basically, we don't want to build your tanks in our factories because when you collapse like the French, they're no good to us. We want American tanks to be built in our factories. We want to tool up uh, our military capability. So ultimately, the British have to take American designs, not British, uh, because the Americans in the summer of 1940 think that Britain is on its way out. Uh, what this leads to is actually quite a unique co cooperation where uh, the British team give the Americans advice based on their combat experience uh, in France on what that tank should uh, look like, uh, how much armour it should have, what kind of gun it should have, what kind of radio equipment. Um, and again, this is actually quite startling uh, because the design and development of a new tank should normally be a closely held state secret. You wouldn't share that information with anyone. Um, and in fact, the way that the Americans invite this British tank mission in uh, is a sign that the cooperation is going to be different. It might not be perfect. Uh, it might only be where it suits American interest in certain cases. Uh, but it's actually going to be quite uh, a deep relationship. And so the American uh, medium tank, M3, uh, which is a terribly compromised design, but it has a, a British designed turret for the British orders, and it first sees action in Libya in May 1942, uh, where it offers British tank crews uh, a much better tank uh, than uh, they had before. And when the Americans develop the design into the Sherman, the first one that they send over to Britain is named Michael, in order of Michael Dewar, uh, who was the head of the British tank mission. And you can still see that tank uh, at Bovington. So that shows the closeness of this relationship. You'll also notice this is an order uh, by November 1940 for 2,000 tanks at the cost of 132 lots of zeros. Um, a huge amount of money. And that's only on one program. The British are ta panic buying aircraft, ships, trucks, you name it. Um, and this means that uh, really by December 1940, Britain has run out of ready cash. It's not that Britain is bankrupt, but America, after its experience in the First World War uh, and the Great Depression, when Britain defaulted on its war loans in 1931, uh, Amer American law was that, yes, uh, any foreign power could purchase war material in America, uh, as long as America was neutral, uh, but you had to purchase it in ready cash. <coughs> and... By December 1940, we've put 1,000 million in in orders, and we've got 574 million left in currency. Oh dear. Uh, ultimately, it's Roosevelt's fire hose. Uh, he, me he, he mentions this, or he explains it to the American people in one of his fireside addresses, where he says that uh, if your neighbor's house is burning down, you lend him the hose. You don't ask him to buy the hose before you let him use it. Um, and ultimately it's Lend-Lease, it's the Lend-Lease Bill uh, <coughs> which enables Britain to continue the war. Uh, because ultimately without all of these orders for military equipment that have been placed, uh, if they had not been, if, if we defaulted on that we would have no, no real way of carrying on the war. And this means 
that, again, the Americans want to observe quite closely British methods. They send people over in 1940. Uh, they send a special observer group uh, across to London in May 1941, where they uh, are all plain clothed. Uh, and uh, they would have, if you'd asked them, they would have denied to you that they were Brit uh, American officers, uh, both naval, uh, U.S. Army, Air Force, and U.S. Army, because America was neutral. It shouldn't have been doing this, but Roosevelt is prepared to bend the rules. And by the time that you get to the Atlantic Charter Conference in August 1941, Churchill actually uh, and his staff, uh, they think that the United States is going to declare war on Germany. And when they leave that conference, they are bitterly disappointed that America has not. Churchill knows that once the Americans are in the war, ultimately Britain will survive. Until the Americans are in the war, that remains in doubt. Um, and of course, one aspect, I'm, I'm talking about the Anglo-American relationship, but one thing we mustn't forget is the fact that Britain gains an ally quite by accident uh, in June 1941 when Hitler declares war uh, on the Soviet Union. And in many respects, the Red Army becomes the substitute for the French Army. 70% of German casualties uh, are inflicted on the Eastern Front. Um, that is not, uh, and maybe I'll explain that more in questions, that is not to uh, downplay the importance of the Anglo-American war effort uh, in any sense. Uh, but it means that German attention uh, is now being diverted uh, into many different theatres. And of course it is the Japanese who make the terrible, terrible mistake of waking the sleeping giant by attacking Pearl Harbor. Uh, being flippant, you might argue that the date that the Japanese lose the Second World War is the 7th of December 1941. Uh, because once America is in the war, Japan is not going to uh, win that conflict. Um, but it brings America into the war, and Churchill gets on another battleship, gets across to Washington to hammer out uh, Anglo-American strategy uh, that very Christmas. Uh, hence this rather uh, homely uh, cartoon. Uh, go back to bed, Winston. That noise on the roof is probably Stalin or Chiang Kai-shek coming to join the conference. Uh, of course... Actually, it's just the British and Americans at that conference. And so I suppose the picture we have of the Second World War is one of the United Nations all fighting together and of Anglo-American strategy following uh, a logical, almost inevitable path to victory. Uh, and I'm afraid that just isn't how it was. More importantly, um, the United Nations were united, uh, but some were definitely more equal than others. And Churchill worked hard to ensure that, for example, the Canadians and the Australians uh, were not admitted to Anglo-American strategy making. They were dominions, and therefore they took their lead from uh, the home country. Thank you very much. The tension in all of this is of course that the United States had been attacked by Japan and that for Britain, Germany was always uh, the key problem. So in fact, Churchill had managed to persuade Roosevelt uh, on a, a strategy even before the Americans were in the war. And it seems almost banal to point this out but grand strategy in 1942 can be boiled down effectively to left or right. I'm actually I'm using the wrong hands. Right or left. Um, was it going to be Germany or was it going to be Japan? You can't fight both simultaneously. So which will you concentrate upon? Um, 
Churchill managed to persuade Roosevelt that Germany was indeed the most dangerous and therefore had to be tackled first. So Germany first became the slogan, as it were, of the Anglo-American uh, war effort. But even once you d decided that or determined that, there were a whole range of competing strategies of how you might achieve that. And Admiral Ernest uh, King, the head of the US Navy, was always convinced that the, the, the US should go all out uh, in the Pacific. He really didn't give a button for Europe. He wanted the war in the Pacific. Um, General George Marshall wanted a cross-channel attack as quickly as possible, and he needed to remind the British Chiefs of Staff on more than one occasion that uh, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Uh, and General Sir Alan Brooke, uh, you can see his views there, the conquest of North Africa so as to reopen the Mediterranean, restore a million tonnes of shipping by avoiding the Cape Route, then eliminate Italy, bring in Turkey, threaten Southern Europe, and then liberate France. So that's very much sequential, it's peripheral, and it's going to take years. Uh, when Marshall turns up in London in April 1942, he's like, right, so we're going to make a cross-channel attack in September 1942, April 1943 at the latest. Uh, what don't you understand? The Americans want this war over. Germany first, deal with Germany, then on to Japan. All done by 1944. Sound good? The problem is the British have to show that that's not actually feasible. And meanwhile, that's Brooke's strategy of long-term sequential. Uh, the bomber barons, both Carl Spatz and uh, Air, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Harris, think, well, don't recruit huge armies and navies, just bomb Germany into submission with uh, a massive bombing force. So you have all these different competing strategies and approaches to the war and actually you have to hammer out what is going to work so uh, here are the oh I think I've lost my ah there we are um, uh, here are the, the two key plans sledgehammer is the immediate cross channel assault uh, gymnast is Churchill's phrase for an attack on French North Africa uh, I still love the idea of gymnast leaping nimbly over uh, the German defences. <coughs> but of course Roosevelt and Marshall look at that and say, well, it, it might be a perfectly good plan, but it's about as far away from Germany as you can get. It's not even in Europe. Um, Bolero, of course, is the rising beat of the, the shifting of the American army and American combat power uh, to Britain. Well, ultimately... Uh, sledgehammer, uh, as I'm sure you realise, does not uh, take place. Ultimately, because in July 1942, uh, the British point blank refuse. Uh, when the American staff start calling Sledgehammer a sacrificial landing, uh, the British understandably pull the plug. And so it is that it's this man, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who's appointed the commander of the first <coughs> Allied uh, expeditionary force uh, who even in March 1941 was a colonel and by March 1942 is a major general <coughs> by the torch operation in November 1942 he's a lieutenant general so how's that for rapid promotion um, the torch landings themselves don't need to uh, detain us for long um, but they are the first real expression of some of the power of the Anglo-American alliance. And that is not just in terms of military force, in terms of uh, army units. It's the fact that the British and Americans can draw troops from uh, Norfolk, Virginia. They can draw them from uh, the eastern seaboard of the United States, uh, from the Clyde, from Liverpool, from Bristol, and bring them all together at an appointed place and time to make an amphibious landing. Uh, that was uh, an incredibly powerful way uh, of making war. Um, 
ultimately in Tunisia um, the British and Americans get into a terrible mess uh, as they try and, and capture Tunis um, the, the, this is a grainy photograph of Coldstream Guardsmen on Longstop Hill the Coldstream Guards manage to take Longstop Hill or at least think they do they're relieved by an American unit who misunderstand British terms for things like relief in place the Coldstream Guard uh, guards mark, trudge back to their uh, rest area and uh, just as they reach there uh, they're told that the Americans have lost the hill and that they must trudge back into action. You can imagine what they thought of that. Um, so there are real growing pains in Tunisia as these two armies uh, learn how uh, to work together. And there is actually a direct link uh, with the Royal Green Jackets in 1940, uh, the colonel of the regiment had actually written a letter which gained publicity uh, in uh, America, citing the 18th century link, citing that family legacy. Uh, and from 1940 onwards, uh, a number of Americans volunteered for service uh, in, in the King's Royal Rifle Corps. Uh, these were the ones that were left by... Uh, July 1943. There's a number uh, that weren't in that photograph. They'd uh, been fought and either killed or wounded at the Battle of Alamein. Um, and over, over 20 American, uh, uh, Americans volunteered to fight uh, in the King's Royal Rifle Corps during the war. So that direct link with that family legacy of the 18th century. This is a famous picture from Casablanca in January 1943 when once again the British managed to out-argue uh, the Americans. Marshall was furious that at this conference uh, King wouldn't support him. Uh, King got an uplift for the resources to be deployed in the Pacific and that meant he was quite happy. If the British wanted to go to Sicily or Sardinia, he didn't really care. Um, and we admire. Uh, Marshall's aide uh, wrote at the time, we came, we listened, and we were conquered. Um, part of the problem, of course, was that the Americans used one of their glitzy new uh, airliners to fly across the Atlantic and leaving all their staff back in Washington. They had to scrounge staff officers from the American units that were in Tunisia. Uh, the British were much more professional. They actually brought a ship, uh, HMS Bulolo, st stuffed to the gunnels, not only with staff officers, but with all the planning uh, papers from London. They were literally put on, on the ship, uh, and it was moored off Casablanca. And it meant that every night uh, the British uh, could say, well, we need this paper, we need this uh, planning document, and the next day were able to present it to the Americans in conference. Um, Marshall did not enjoy the Casablanca conference, uh, it's uh, uh, safe to say. But it was the last conference uh, that the British managed to really get the drop on the Americans. They planned properly and prepared properly for all of the later ones. Uh, that meant that uh, the next major Anglo-American operation was the invasion of Sicily in July 1943. And again, this map would suggest that uh, all went swimmingly well. Um, of course, that's not quite how it worked out. This campaign sees the uh, real development of rivalry uh, between Montgomery, uh, the 8th Army commander, uh, and a certain uh, General Patton, uh, commander of the US 7th Army. Um, and when the American forces land here around Jella, uh, Montgomery imagines that they will simply shield his flank as he drives the 8th Army to an inevitable uh, victory. Uh, ultimately, Patton, even though he's given a standstill order by General Alexander, uh, decides that he's not going to wait that way uh, and drives on Palermo and ultimately for Messina. Um, we see a similar situation uh, in the Italian campaign. Again, when you look at a map like that, it looks like this is all planned. Uh, it really wasn't. Uh, when the Allies land at Salerno in uh, September 1943, 
uh, it's still assumed that the Germans won't fight for Italy, uh, that they will evacuate. And indeed, uh, Field Marshal Rommel was giving Hitler that uh, advice. Uh, ultimately, of course, the Italian campaign uh, becomes one of the uh, bloodiest and hardest slogs for uh, British, American, uh, South African, Canadian, Polish and Brazilian troops, uh, which fight in a multinational, uh, two multinational forces, really from all the way from the toe to uh, the top of the boat. And um, <coughs> relations, uh, although in propaganda terms, it looks like General Oliver Lees, Harold Alexander and Mark Clark uh, were brothers in arms. Uh, in reality, uh, certainly after Mark Clark, uh, uh, or once Oliver Lees learned that Mark Clark had actually ordered American troops to fire on any British troops that might enter Rome before his troops, uh, Relations between them were frosty, to say the, le to say the least. Um, ultimately, uh, the battles for Monte Cassino from January to May 1944, four battles, uh, are the most reminiscent of the First World War, um, in terms of the British experience anyway, uh, of the Second World War. Uh, and Mark Clark does get his moment in the sun. Uh, he gets to Rome on the 5th of June, 1944, just one day before D-Day. So he gets the headlines in the newspapers for one day. And he's uh, very, very cross uh, when D-Day steals that thunder the next day. Uh, so let's turn our attention then to the cross-channel attack um, just commemorated uh, very recently uh, and I think still very fresh in everybody's minds. Um, but Bolero, the build-up of American troops and combat power, I think is much less well known. Here are the peaks and troughs of Bolero. So here's where American troops are coming in. This is when uh, Sledgehammer is cancelled and Torch takes place where actually the Americans, this build-up that would have gone like that, uh, actually fades away again, so that by April 1943, <coughs> there's practically no Americans uh, in, certainly army units uh, in, in, in Britain, although the bomb offensive <coughs> is building up. And it's not until 1944 that it really peaks. Um, the big historical question, which nobody can really answer is whether Bolero would have worked in 1942. Because, of course, at that point, the U-boats were still very much active. And it's not until May 1943, and you can see it dramatically there, that the U-boat menace is, if not destroyed, then at least suppressed sufficiently to allow convoys to really flow across. And I think one of the issues here in terms of the British perception, our perception of the Americans in the Second World War, uh, is that one and a half million American service uh, personnel are in Britain by May 1944. And the British people both then and now think that that was the whole American force. So that when the two armies go ashore on D-Day, 50-50, we think we were still equal. But that one and a half million men was actually only the vanguard. There were division after division still stacked up in America, waiting for the invasion to take place so that they could be shipped directly to France. Uh, and we've never quite, I think, uh, gotten our heads around that perception. Uh, the American invasion of Britain uh, remains one of the most extraordinary social events uh, in this uh, country. Um, and uh, it has to be said that when the Americans first arrived in Britain from April 1942 onwards, um, while their relations with uh, the general population could be quite mixed, uh, sometimes very friendly, uh, sometimes not so friendly, the relationship between uh, British soldiers and American soldiers tended to be quite bad. 
Uh, American soldiers were paid far more. Uh, as you can see from that, even American privates uh, wore a tie. Uh, so uh, British people tended to mistake them all as officers. Uh, but some of the, well, were they jokes uh, or jibes that uh, the Americans would throw out in pubs uh, in 1942 weren't exactly calculated to win friends uh, and influence people. Uh, get me a drink as fast as you got out of Dunkirk. Um, <laughs> there's four colours in the Union Jack, red, white, blue and yellow uh, was, a, was another one. Uh, and of course very impolite uh, 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 descriptions of uh, British uh, beer uh, in particular. Uh, American soldier takes a pint of beer, says, takes one sip and says, can you put that back in the horse? Um, <laughs> in fact, by 1944, with, I think, the British Army's uh, combat record re-established, actually relations were much better than they had been in 1942. But it's uh, an interesting period anyway. Um, and one thing that we... Uh, consistently forget is actually just how much work the British were doing in America. So we're very aware of the American invasion of Britain. We're much less aware of the British invasion of America, uh, which to some extent has, uh, has remained to this day. There is still uh, a significant British Army staff uh, in Washington, nothing like the numbers uh, of the Second World War. Uh, and it gave me a real uh, sense of uh, amusement when I calculated the numbers of all the uh, British Army staff spread throughout America, uh, that in fact they totaled more uh, than the force that had marched on Washington in 1814. <laughs> and they did vital work in all these very boring uh, boards, uh, things like Combined Munitions Assignment Board. Uh, sounds very, very dull. But you, hopefully you can see the importance of it. That, again, this is actually an alliance where both partners are working out what their needs are, uh, determining it, and then shipping it out through all these other mechanisms. That's a level of cooperation and coordination which most allies uh, simply couldn't even have uh, attempted. Uh, and it means that... Uh, when the ammunition is, is made, whether it's in Britain or America, it can then be shipped to the requisite front and uh, the job is done. Uh, by 1944, by, in fact by 1943, uh, when COSAC is set up, British and American staffs have become integrated. So you have... Americans and British staff officers, both Army, Navy and Air Force, uh, working together very, very closely. Uh, and when Cossack is given the job of planning the cross-channel attack, uh, Brooke says to him, well, there it is, it won't bloody work, but you've got to make it, uh, which I think is something which many staff officers over the years have had to wrestle with. Um, when we look at that picture of Eisenhower and his key commanders just before D-Day. I think the thing that's remarkable about it is that it is indeed British and Americans and all three services all operating together. And that might well be the propaganda uh, when we think of some of the frictions between them, but nonetheless it, it shows that the vision and intention was to operate in a properly integrated way. I'm not going to labour the point about Eisenhower's command. <coughs> but in many respects, I think what's remarkable about Eisenhower's decision to go, taken at Southwark Park near Portsmouth on the 5th of June, is that he was trusted to make it. Roosevelt and Churchill, who were constantly meddling, when it came to the decision whether this invasion was to be launched with all the consequences uh, inherent in it, Eisenhower, a military officer, was trusted to take that decision. It wasn't a political one. And I cannot think of a political leader today 
that would not interfere with a decision such as that, given the momentous consequences. Uh, the Battle of Normandy is far too long and complex for me to go into any detail here. Suffice to say that I do actually see the battle for Normandy as Monty's finest hour. He stares down the German commanders, whether Rommel or von Kluge, and he doesn't make a serious mistake. There is huge controversy over Montgomery's uh, conduct of the Normandy battle, whether the plan went according to plan, uh, whether he had to adapt it, uh, whether the British were too slow, whether the Americans got bogged down in the bocage uh, because of their inexperience or because of the nature of the terrain. But ultimately, uh, actually, the British and the Americans confront the Germans with a problem that they cannot solve. The British mount a number of operations, none of which are as successful as Montgomery claimed they would be, when we think of Epsom, Goodwood uh, uh, and the like. But every time the British mount an operation like that, they do draw German attention around Caen. And once one has been launched, the Germans know that the clock is ticking before another one will be launched. Meanwhile, the Americans, using their tactics, which are much more to exert continuous pressure, and that's one of the reasons why their casualties are much, much higher, uh, confront the Germans with another problem. Had it been one army or the other, the Germans might have found a solution. But when they're confronted with both those problems simultaneously, they ultimately cannot prevail. Uh, so Montgomery is land force commander uh, during the battle for Normandy. Uh, on the 1st of September 1944, as according to plan, Eisenhower takes overall command uh, as land force commander and supreme allied commander. And I'm afraid to say that Monty, having done so well in the Normandy campaign, uh, and he is promoted to field marshal on, on the same day, the 1st of September, uh, as Eisenhower takes command, but he then fights uh, an, a long and wearisome campaign to be reinstated as land force commander uh, until December 1944, uh, and Eisenhower gets thoroughly annoyed by it. In terms of the strategies uh, of how to reach Germany, uh, not only does Montgomery have this campaign about land force commander, this debate and argument about who should be in command, uh, but it's a very different approach in terms of how Germany should be attacked. He wants one narrow thrust uh, through Belgium into Germany. And Eisenhower and Schaeff have planned a much broader front. Um, these Debates on strategy go on throughout the war, and they've gone on with historians uh, ever since. Uh, ultimately, Eisenhower decides to back Montgomery for what becomes Operation Market Garden, uh, which nearly works, but doesn't quite. It becomes a bridge too far. And with the failure of Market Garden, this then narrow thrust uh, instead of leading across the Rhine and leading to uh, a German industrial collapse anyway uh, in 1944, it ultimately doesn't lead very far. Once Arnhem is finished, the Allies are left with Eisenhower's broad front, but actually insufficient troops to really make uh, a difference at that point. Uh, Eisenhower has 90, or the, the American army, has 90 divisions and there will not be any more. And by the winter of 1944, all of those divisions uh, are deployed. What's worse, and this may surprise you, by December 1944, Eisenhower is getting worrying, uh, really disturbing reports from his frontline commanders that they're running out of artillery shells. American artillery shells. Not, well, not running out, but that they need to start rationing them. Uh, why? Well, the war was over, wasn't it? After D-Day, American industry starts repurposing for peacetime. Germany's going to be defeated. So 
the allocations of artillery shells begin to drop. And just at the point that Eisenhower actually needs more resource, he finds that the tap has been turned off. Uh, awkward, to say the least. Ultimately, of course, this is resolved by the Germans attacking uh, in the Bulge, uh, or what becomes known as the Battle of the Bulge, in December uh, 1944. Huge surprise uh, to everyone. And while this is often portrayed as an American battle, which it primarily was, I actually see this as uh, the triumph of the Anglo-American alliance because Montgomery uh, does what he's supposed to do and holds the northern shoulder. Bradley and Patton do what they're supposed to do and take Baston. And Eisenhower's command of this battle uh, as the Supreme Allied Commander is actually very far-sighted. This gets all, all of these very positive aspects get completely lost in the furore that develops from Montgomery's press conference on the 7th of Jan January 1945, when his scripted remarks are absolutely fine and talk about allied solidarity, uh, but when he goes off script, he starts using the word I. This was the most interesting battle that I ever handled, suggesting that he was in overall command, which he most certainly wasn't. And the American newspapers uh, have a hissy fit. <laughs> By this time, uh, in fact, just a, a week or two before, uh, Montgomery has very narrowly avoided being sacked by Eisenhower uh, because he had re-raised the whole land force command issue. And at that point, Eisenhower lost his patience. And it was actually Montgomery's chief of staff, uh, Freddie de Guangle, uh, that saves his chief's bacon. Well, you'll be very glad to know I'm reaching the end. Um, the, the last tactical cooperation um, is actually some American paratroops in the 2nd Guards Armoured Brigade, which after the crossing of the Rhine uh, race uh, forwards uh, as the German resistance uh, begins to collapse. Uh, and that's the last tactical cooperation. By this stage, uh, the, the British forces are racing for Hamburg uh, uh, and on to Denmark in what actually becomes a very far-sighted move which forestalls the Soviets reaching Denmark. Um, of course, one of the last controversies of the war uh, is whether, as everybody had expected, the Anglo-Americans would drive on Berlin. Uh, Eisenhower eventually decides that they will not. Had the British and Americans driven on Berlin, they might have captured Berlin. We'll never know. Uh, but we would have faced a Cold War, ultimately, uh, with the Soviets in Denmark. And that might have been very awkward. So ultimately, the picture we have of the end of the Second World War, particularly in Britain is very much Montgomery's taking of the surrender of German forces in North, North Germany. Montgomery realised the theatre of the moment, that it had to be filmed, and that it had to be seen that the German commanders were surrendering to him. And he got that stage management and that theatre absolutely right. Uh, but that was not the final surrender of German forces. That could only be to Eisenhower as the Supreme Allied Commander. And a few days later, uh, this, the actual surrender cer ceremony took place at Eisenhower's HQ uh, at Raz. Problem was, Eisenhower, due to his deep hatred of the Germans and not wishing to accord them the, as it were, the respect of meeting them face to face, refused to take part in the surrender ceremony. So there are pictures of that ceremony, but they don't include Eisenhower, which <coughs> meant that he was left with this rather weak image of holding the pens that had been used, but not being present. Um, so the image that certainly we have in Britain is of Montgomery, but we should actually remember Eisenhower's 
uh, ceremony as well. So there we are. That's a very rough canter, very quick canter through the Anglo-American relationship between the two armies. Uh, and there's lots of tactical detail and stories that uh, I, I'm afraid I've skipped over. You may well be aware, um, I mean, almost every second-hand bookshop you go into, you will find a, a copy of uh, Montgomery's memoirs. Um, but in fact, the way that we remember this relationship, uh, flawed though it was, um, uh, in many respects, I think ultimately it does match up to Marshall's description, the most complete unification of military effort ever achieved by two allies. What we remember today, however, is actually seen through the lens of the Battle of the Memoirs, which takes place in the 1950s, where the uh, issues of rivalry, uh, of debate, of dissension uh, become highlighted when everybody writes their memoirs, rather than actually the quite unique cooperation that actually took place during the war. Uh, and I think that's what we should remember, not necessarily the stories that were told in the memoirs. Thank you very much. <coughs>
across the, w with the barrier of the Atlantic in between you, ultimately it's not going to be a comfortable relationship. Um, therefore, support Britain as much as you can. Um, prime the pump of American industry because America was completely demobilized. Its army in 1939 is 140,000 men strong. It's 40th in the world. We, we think of America as this great military power. In 1939, it really isn't. Uh, it has a fleet. Uh, it really doesn't have an army. Um, so Roosevelt knows it's going to take time to build that. Um, so whether that's cynical or whether that's just good strategic thinking, I'll leave up to you. Um, how would you categorize the degree of uh, cooperation between the British and the Americans in the Pacific War, which was clearly dominated overwhelmingly by the Americans? Our contribution, I think, was mainly uh, naval. Yes, yes. So that's a much more difficult relationship, uh, particularly uh, as uh, one of the key American commanders, uh, General Stilwell, is very much an anglophobe. Um, Eisenhower, uh, who becomes this such a key figure, he's, he, certainly to begin with, he's neither an anglophile or an anglophobe, but he has this vision of working together. He realises that the alliance will be strong if we work together. Stillwell never feels that. So relations in the Pacific are always much spikier. Um, there's far more arguments over resource share, etc. Um, and yet, when you think of uh, some of the actions in Burma in 1944, like the battles of Kohima and Imphal, actually there is considerable uh, American air transport along with British air transport that make those battles possible. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, I think it's a much more mixed picture uh, of cooperation, but many, many more uh, arguments and a, a much spikier uh, relationship. Is it true there was an American political strategy that through then lease and other plans dismantled the British Empire after the uh, well, again, whether that is, is a strategy uh, or whether it's simply what happens uh, is a moot point. Um, but uh, the Americans did not like British imperial preference and the Sterling area before the Second World War. And there were many, many American businessmen that wanted rid of imperial preference and the Sterling area. Um, what Roosevelt ha would have done at the end of the Second World War, we will never know because, of course, he dies in April 1945. And much of this special relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill uh, wasn't written down. It w there was never a treaty between the British and Americans in this war. It was all done by understanding. Uh, so it means that when Truman comes in, uh, the British are operating on a whole range of assumptions which Roosevelt may or may not have cleaved to, but which no longer apply. Hence the fact that Britain is shut out of the Manhattan Project at the end of the war, even though it was, uh, pri not primarily, but certainly in the initial stages in 1940, uh, it was British science uh, and exiled Germans uh, who had come to Britain uh, who really kick-started the Manhattan Project. And it also means that the Americans cut Lend-Lease literally a few days after uh, the end of the war, uh, whereas the British understanding had been that Lend-Lease would continue for at least a period of months uh, in order for British industry to uh, and the British to reset for peacetime. That doesn't happen, and Maynard Keynes uh, famously has to go to Washington to negotiate uh, an emergency loan to keep Britain afloat in 1945. Uh, and I believe I'm right in thinking that we finally paid that off in 2007. Um, so uh, when Roosevelt dies and when the war ends, many American business interests and many interests in Congress see that this is the time to deal with imperial preference in the Sterling area, and my goodness, they do.
because by that stage we're in no position to argue. So let's not be too misty-eyed about this relationship, uh, particularly as it uh, uh, develops after the war. Diving rather down into detail, one of my American relations used to tell me a story that he was at a thing called the American Field Ambulance before America was yeah. in the war, and they were actually part of Eighth Army. Uh, yes, that is true. Um, there were also Americans serving in the Home Guard uh, in London in 1940, uh, for example. Um, so uh, this is one of the more, uh, shall we say, softer aspects of it. There, there were some common bonds between Britain and America uh, before the war. Uh, there are some common bonds between Britain and, Amer and, and America today. Churchill's mother, after all, was American. So the elites, uh, in, in particular from the 1890s, shared certain uh, interests, shall we say. And uh, yes, the, the American volunteer ambulances, uh, there were Americans uh, serving uh, in ambulances during the Blitz as well. Um, uh, in a rather sadder point, I suppose some of the American observers uh, serve with the British 8th Army, mainly in a technical capacity. Uh, so well, they're not serving with 8th Army, they're observing 8th Army during the desert campaigns. And there are Americans uh, killed during Operation Crusader, killed and wounded, uh, who of course cannot be acknowledged by the US government as even being there. So they only get their Purple Hearts after uh, many, many years because America was neutral and it shouldn't have had any observers there. So there are stories like that of uh, really quite unusual things that bring um, uh, Americans into contact with the British far earlier than we might imagine. Roosevelt and Churchill were both politicians. Is it possible that they were prepared to devolve the overlord decisions to Eisenhower in case it went wrong? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, yes, I think that might be true. Maybe I'm being too uh, optimistic. Yes, I think that's a very good point. How, how early um, were the Americans sharing in the intelligence of what was happening in Germany? I mean, were, was the German, um, sorry, the American ambassador in Berlin reporting back to Washington what, what Hitler was up to <coughs> and what was uh, the, this threat was going to be a worry? Uh, was Britain sharing intelligence to sort of warm them up, if you like? So intelligence is a, a really fascinating area, and it's much more complicated than it appears. So uh, today we see the Americans as being, uh, you know, and particularly our intelligence cooperation with the United States as being a really key aspect to our relationship with the Americans. <coughs> At the beginning of the Second World War, uh, British intelligence did not trust American intelligence whatsoever. Uh, they didn't necessarily have equal opposite numbers to even speak to. There was no CIA, for example. That's set up in, in, in nascent forms uh, during the Second World War. And uh, American... Uh, intelligence procedures and security procedures were really quite lax uh, because they were not dealing in the front line of intelligence security as the British had been for many, many decades. Um, so it took a long time, actually, for the British to share, for example, the Enigma secret, the fact that we had uh, broken uh, the, the German Enigma codes. Um, because we were very concerned that the Americans would leak it. Um, so it's not really until 1943-44 that intelligence cooperation is, has become really quite tight and remained so ever since. Um, one example I'll give uh, is Colonel Bonner Fellers, who's the key American uh, observer uh, in Egypt and Libya during 41-42, and he is sending back to Washington all kinds of detail on the British Eighth Army, 
Uh, now, when America becomes an ally, there is uh, obviously it's decided that everything should be shared with Bonner Fellers. He's now an ally. And he sends everything back to Washington, including, uh, because I've seen his reports, including the grid references of British divisional HQs in the desert. <laughs> now, Washington didn't really need that kind of detail. He was being very, very dil diligent in sending all of this back. What he didn't know was that the Italian intelligence service had broken the American diplomatic code by sending a cleaner into the Vatican City to steal the code book from the American delegation in the Vatican City. And so every message that Bonnerfeller sent to Washington, and my goodness he sent a lot, was intercepted, decrypted and translated by the Int Italian intelligence service and given to Rommel within a matter of hours uh, of its transmission. Um, I'm afraid to say I think that explains what happens at the Battle of Gazala far more than anything else. Uh, so the British were quite right to be sceptical of the Americans, and it takes the Americans a long time to learn uh, about intelligence, security, and procedures. And they ultimately, they learn them from us. What is the degree of uh, amicable cooperation and strategic co cooperation between the uh, Royal Air Force bombing campaign and uh, the American... Uh, Army Air Force bombing campaign. So, uh, in many respects, uh, you know, now I think I would include all military aspects to the to, to the book, but it would simply have been too great. Uh, I would never have finished it. Um, actually, the relationship between the Royal Air Force and the U.S. Army Air Corps is, if anything, uh, closer. Um, American observers see what the Royal Royal Air Force does during the Battle of Britain because they're they're shown around all the bases um, and in terms of concept and sharing doctrine and techniques and methods uh, Bomber Command and US uh, Army Air Force are very very close <coughs> of course ulti ultimately the Americans uh, go for very different methods but the, the level of cooperation is, is really quite intense um, of course the one secret that the Americans won't share with us. Uh, we, in the Tizard mission in 1940, we share with the Americans all kinds of things, from our nuclear program to uh, the cavity magnetron, the, 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 the heart of uh, centimetric radar, for example. But the Americans will not share the Norden bomb site, uh, which they are convinced will mean that they can do accurate daylight bombing. Uh, and of course, as it proves, uh, it doesn't quite work. Time but for one more. <clears throat> After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, I believe Hitler declared war on the US three days later. He does indeed. If he hadn't done that, would they have come and fought in Europe, or would they have done Japan first? That's one of those speculations that is almost impossible <coughs> to answer. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to see how Roosevelt would have been able to declare war on Germany, actually. Very difficult to see. And Congress may well not have accepted it. So Hitler did the Americans and the British a huge favour by declaring war on America. From Hitler's conception, however, war with America was already underway. Roosevelt had moved the zone of protection for American convoys well out into the Atlantic. Uh, an American destroyer, uh, the USS Reuben James, had already been sunk. Americans had already been killed by uh, U-boat action. So Hitler, in a sense, believed that war was already underway with America and that he was simply ratifying reality. He also made the terrible miscalculation, which was that he believed that he would, he would win in Russia by the time that the Americans would be involved in the war properly, and that once Russia was defeated, Germany was secure. 
Uh, and actually, that strategic ca calculation was absolutely correct. Uh, the problem is that Germany didn't defeat the Soviet Union. Neil, absolute tour de force. <laughs> some, very, some very interesting questions answered in detail and absolutely immediately. And uh, absolutely fascinating. I often heard it said that uh, the Allies were, uh, well, the Allies were separated by a common language. Uh, that didn't come out at all, but we can perhaps talk about that later on. But thank you very much indeed. Absolutely wonderful to have you back and another real tour de force. You have certainly earned at least a couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs>